Hi, this is Rob Hawley from the Fremont Peak Observatory. Welcome to the next section of photographing a solar eclipse. In this section we'll talk about equipment and what you should bring. Of all the chapters of my 2017 video, this is the one that required the most change. A lot has changed since 2017, not only equipment-wise, but also the circumstances are much more diverse. So let's get into it. In the last section we talked about KISS, keep it simple stupid, and how important that is to successful eclipse photography. In this section we'll talk about how to achieve that. The first and easiest alternative is wide angle. I use a GoPro set to movie mode. Make sure you set the highest resolution. You can also use your phone either in movie mode or in picture mode. Lastly in 2008 I used a DSLR with an extremely wide angle lens. The advantage of that approach is you get very high quality images which you can then string together with your favorite movie program. For the remainder of this talk let's assume that you don't want to do wide angle or you don't want to do wide angle exclusively. I actually do both usually and so let's concentrate on trying to get close-up pictures of the eclipse. So let's start with optics. I use two different sets of optics depending on the scenario. My preferred solution is to use a TV76. That's been with me to Libya and to Svalbard. It has almost the perfect magnification for this problem. But I found that it's not compatible with some of the lighter weight mounts that I'm now using in remote scenarios. So I've supplemented it with a Canon 300 millimeter lens. The advantage of the Canon it being a fixed focal length is that it does really sharp pictures. It does have image stabilization which I have used. With the Capture Equips program that I'm going to be discussing in a couple minutes, the one disadvantage of the Canon which which was that I had to in the past manually focus it is removed and since Capture Eclipse can control the focusing that actually becomes an advantage rather than a disadvantage. I'm sure some of you will consider bringing your SCT to the April 24 eclipse but here's something to consider. The images shown here are simulations of what the field of view is for various focal lengths and it's from Fred Espinak's website. Remember when you image the moon you're only looking at a small portion of what's going to be seen during an eclipse. If you want to capture the corona you'll need a much wider field of view. Take a look at these images and decide for yourself what your goal is. On the other hand your SCT may do a marvelous job in capturing the phenomena around the surface of the eclipse sun. Here are two non-simulated examples of frame size. In the first case I'm showing you a full frame from my TV76 and here is from a 300 millimeter telephoto. One additional piece of equipment that you should consider putting on your telescope is a device called a soul searcher. This will allow you to see whether your camera is pointing towards the sun or not. It saved me a couple times. Kendrick offers a similar product that sticks on your lens. One of the biggest determiners of your equipment will be the nature of the site and where you observe and how you get there. Observing from a ship, being a part of a tour group that you join after a long plane flight, or traveling yourself to a domestic location, each have their unique requirements. For each you have to ha balance that on one case you're on a moving platform, in another you will have to lug your equipment through multiple stops and may face severe weight risk limits. For the last, you are limited only by how much luggage you're willing to stuff into your car or take with you on a short plane flight. Each of these will affect your choice of optics and mount. We'll discuss each of these in the next few slides. Here's the first of the three scenarios, and that is observing from a moving ship. I've observed from a ship six times with varying degrees of success. The picture shown here is 2016, which was the most successful. Some observers will observe the April 24th eclipse from off the coast of Mexico. The 2026 eclipse is mostly over water. Trips are available from Greenland and I would expect some to take the short trip from Iceland. Let's discuss what I have found to be the most successful. I found on a ship it's best to mount your camera on a monopod. That allows you to compensate for the ship's movement or if the captain does not cooperate. I also chose to use the 300 millimeter lens since it's lighter and has stabilization. In this eclipse I triggered the camera with a timer. The next scenario is a trip that involves a long plane flight. Here weight is a critical concern because 
you're going to have to lug your equipment not only to the eclipse site but through the rest of the trip. And being a good travel agent, they're going to fill up the trip with stuff. In 2019, we had two major moves that had to be accommodated. Plus, twice we had to leave our equipment in the hotel while we did a side trip. What I've done is I've used a, a lightweight mount from iOptron. And let me tell you, this thing is really impressive. After very carefully aligning it to the south, I was in the southern hemisphere after all in 2019, that kept the track on for nearly four hours. I was impressed. Unfortunately, the Optron can't handle the weight of the TV-76, so I had to fall back to using my 300 millimeter. The only disadvantage of the Optron is it's a little difficult to do the deck alignment. But if you balance properly, it's manageable. So let me break down this equipment some more. Again, I start with the Canon 300 millimeter lens. And then I use an Ioptron Skyguider Pro camera mount of the full package, including their tripod. Now, their tripod I found in Chile was a little on the heavy side. In 2023, I replaced the Ioptron mount with a carbon fiber mount from Silk, and that worked pretty well. Note the water bottles dangling below the mount. I added some weight to make the tripod more stable. And, of course, for computer, I'm now using a Mac M1 MacBook Pro. The disadvantage of the Aptron is that it has a rather large lithium-ion battery in it. My interpretation of the airline rules is that you will have to take that on board with you in your carry-on rather than packing it. For those who are super observant, you will notice that I put a, there's a piece of plexiglass underneath the lens. This is there to hold the Soul Searcher. I haven't used the Kendrick Soul Searcher equivalent. It may be able to be mounted directly on the lens. In 2016, I also added an aluminum triangle, which allowed me to hold the monopod more vertical. What about taking a real equatorial mount with you? That's something I did twice in Libya and Easter Island. The problem is, even the lightest Orion mount is really heavy, and the legs do not fit in the suitcase. This is probably something that I will not do again. In Svalbard in 2015, we had some fairly serious weight limits, so I had to MacGyver a solution using an AstroTrack. However, that product is no longer available. I noticed on the AstroTrack website they have a new product called AstroTrack 360. I don't know anything about this other than what I see on the website. Lastly, here I am in Oregon in 2017. Weight was no problem. I could ship stuff. I negotiated extra equipment on the bus. So I brought the best equipment I could and didn't worry about how much it weighed. And that's my TV-76 mounted on an Orion mount. The one thing I did differently was I replaced Orion's battery pack with a pair of alligator clips attached to a lantern battery. The Soul Searcher mounts directly on the clamshell that comes with the TV-76, so there was no problem there. In New Mexico, I was not traveling with a tour group. Again, I brought my better Orion mount and a table. My wife and I had a rather full luggage cart, but we were not chasing a tour group. We plan to do the same thing in Texas. As far as solar filters, I've used two different brands. I personally prefer the Botter because I find it a little easier to find sunspots that I can focus on, but I've also used the Orion. They're both excellent filters, and I think it comes down to a choice as to whether you want to see the sun in black and white or in color. So obviously at some point you have to take your solar filter off. So when do you do that? Well, here's what I do. About three minutes before totality, I check to make sure that my camera is tracking properly and check the sun's position in the soul searcher. About two minutes before totality, I stand in front of my telescope, making sure that I completely block the sun. I take the filter off and replace it with a baseball cap. Traditionally, I've used an FPOA hat. You're then primed. About 20 seconds before totality, I then just flick the baseball cap off and let my automated process start taking pictures as C2 approaches. Remember, just like with binoculars, once you take your solar filters off, you cannot look through your optics until you can positively confirm that C2 is completed. Remember, though, after C3, you have to put your solar filter back on. And don't forget. For the magnified images, I've always used a DSLR, originally a Canon 20DA and now a Canon 60DA. These are special cameras that have a different H-alpha filter in them. 
Other friends use other DSLRs. A non-modified camera will give you less intense red for the H-alpha component of the, of the prominences. I also have a DSLR with a H-alpha filter in it, but there may be a white balance problem using it, so I'm not sure it's going to get a plane flight. Here's a real expert trick that was shown to me by one of the professional astronomers I've observed with in the past. If you tilt your camera just right, then you can align it to the ecliptic. Aligning it to the ecliptic means that you'll capture the long streamers instead of having them cropped by the shorter side of your field of view. You can use a planetarium program as I've done to find out where the ecliptic is, is in the, at the time of the eclipse. And then you'll have to manually tilt your camera. Uh, in the case of April 23, it looks like the tilt's pretty easy. And it doesn't have to be within a degree. Just the better you can get it, the better it is. This is likely less important for in April 24, because I would expect, given that the sun is near maximum, that the corona would be about circular. All right, let's say you've decided on a DSLR. Now, how do you trigger it? One thing you don't want to do is to try to trigger it manually. Been there, done that. You'll spend your time during the eclipse futzing with the camera. The easiest way to trigger the camera is to use an automated shutter release. I've used the Canon automated release several times, and I've gotten pretty good results from it. On the slide, I give recommendations as to the, as to the settings that to use. This gives you a pretty good slice through most of the most of the important phenomena, so it's the one that I would recommend going forward. A similar product is available for Nikons. In 2017, I recommended using the program Solar Eclipse Maestro, and I successfully used that in 2017 and 2019. However, that program is no longer compatible with modern Mac operating systems nor modern Mac equipment. Like many people in 2020, I found I had a lot of time on my hands, so I decided to solve this problem myself since I'm a programmer. I created a new app called Capture Eclipse. I've provided a very complete set of documentation at the URL at the bottom of the page, but let me just summarize. Let me make two things clear. This app only supports Canon cameras since that's the only kind of camera I use. There are no plans to support Nikons. Also, there are no plans to support this on Windows. Capture Eclipse runs on Ventura and Sonoma natively on an MX if that's what you have. It will still also run on the latest versions of Monterey. Like Solar Eclipse Maestro, it will predict when events occur and will script the exposures automatically. It provides extensive simulation support so you can learn the application and test your camera before the eclipse. It goes beyond Solar Eclipse Maestro in many ways. First, it will assist in focusing your camera. Next, it understands the limits of mounts and will adjust its operation. For example, if you're on a ship bouncing around, you want to shoot at a higher speed, so it will preferentially use a higher ISO. Finally, it is able to dynamically update the eclipse times based on GPS location. This will allow you to shoot on a moving ship where the exact location is never known ahead of time. While few people will need that in April 24, I've photographed some ships many times, so users will eventually need this. The app is available for free on the Apple Mac App Store. I'm making this available for free so that other astronomers have Canon cameras and use a Mac and can benefit from it, even though that those that, that have PCs and Nikons cannot. This is an app I use myself, so in Silicon Valley tradition, I'm going to be eating my own dog food, so I want this to work. So to sum up this section, there are three things that are most important. First, choose a set of optics that are going to match your photographic goals. Second, if you're shooting from land, use an equatorial mount. And third, figure out a way of auto doing automation that works for you. Don't try to manually operate your camera.